Shalom, friends. I hope you're feeling joyful today. I'm feeling joyful today. I'm feeling, uh, I used to say, hope found within the hopelessness, something that Paul Tillich used to, used to like to say, hope found within hopelessness. But now I'm finding hope within hope. <laughs> and um, it's around vaccines. It's around, uh, it's around uh, uh, democracy. It's around um, the power of kindness, the power, the power of building bridges. And of course, the power of learning Torah together. So we're going to learn some Torah together for the next 50-ish uh, minutes. And it's great to see you all who are here with us. As always, I encourage you to take a few notes if you have some thoughts or questions you want to share when we get to that point um, where folks can uh, share their questions, thoughts, agreements, disagreements, and the like. And for those uh, just who are tapping back in, a reminder that we're looking at the 39 Malachot and how they bridge the uh, Masse Bereshi, the creation of the world, with the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the desert, with the ways that we can bring such a spiritual and intellectual consciousness into the other six days of the week so that we can bring repair, so that when we leave this world, we can leave this world more repaired, more beautiful than how we found it in our own ways. And thankfully, there are a billion opportunities every day to do this. Sometimes we think, we have to be on the front lines of something to repair the world. But in fact, the opportunities, small and large, are all around us. And as always, they start within us. They start within our hearts. They start within our minds. They start within our thinking and roll out into our being and roll out into our actions um, into the broader world. So we're here with Malacha number 19. 19. Our 19th malacha is Oreg, Oreg, which is still on the topic of weaving. Maimonides, the Rambam, explains that this malacha is about comp compilation by bringing multiple entities together called Chibor, Chibor. <laughs> there, we talk in America today about bringing entities together, right? Bringing groups together, kind of the weaving of disparate uh, parts. For this malacha, more specifically, we sew stitches to bring pieces of fabric together to make clothes, blankets, baskets, or the like. Two of the most powerful moments of a Jewish wedding, which of course is an act of bringing together, have to do with clothes. Some people follow a custom of having the parents place a talis or a kittel upon their child at the chuppah marking the last time they dress their child as they hand over their partnership role to the incoming spouse. The other, of course, is the bedekin, the bedekin, which reflects the covering and uncovering of the bride's face with a veil, an article of clothing. Consider this teaching from Rav Shigar. Rav Shigar was not so well known uh, while he was alive, but like most thinkers, becomes more well known after his all too early passing. And he was a neo Hasidic thinker. He was a postmodern thinker. Those two, of course, intersect 
um, to be a neo kabbalist or neo Hasidic thinker intersects with, uh, and that's why one of his books is called, uh, actually I'm blanking on its name, uh, but Broken Tablets, something about broken tablets, which of course is the notion in post-modernity that there has been a break in the meta narrative. There has been a break in the wholeness that in modernity we took for granted. There was a break in the linear path of progress as it was understood. And that's tapping into the uh, postmodern idea, but more deeply here, the Kabbalistic idea of the Shvirata Kelim, the broken, there was a wholeness, a oneness, and there was a cosmic break into fragmentation. And so too, he's saying this is very relevant to our time of fragmentation, of, um, of uh, a lack of clarity, a lack of ultimate a lack of ultimate truth. So here's what Rav Shigar is, is drawing on in relation to the wedding and in relation to the Bedeccan. There is a kind of hiding one's face, a mature kind that derives from the recognition that this, the deepest revelation appears davka precisely through the covering of one's face. Just to repeat that, the deepest revelation occurs from covering, the covering of the face. As Rav Moshe Cordovero states, we call him the Ramak, the Ramak, Rav Moshe Kodaveros of Sfat. The secret of revealing is through covering. Let's say that again, because this might be obvious to some, but to others, this might be a new idea. The secret of revealing is through covering. This recognition that it is impossible to meet that which is inner directly, the essence will always succeed in escaping our regular understanding. As Rabbi Pinchas of Koret said, whatever it is that you want, don't chase it after it. <laughs> okay, wow, there's a lot there in that Rav Shigar piece. There's, he's always a little bit loaded. Reading that in Hebrew was always very hard for me, like reading Rav Cook. It's, there, it's, comp, it's, it's, it's hard reading. But so let's just say that, let's unpack just Rav, Rav Pinchas of Koret first. Whatever it is that you want, don't chase after it. The most obvious example as quoted today is happiness right? The, the, the hardest way to, to be happy is to chase happiness, right? Actually, you chase what's meaningful and what's true and trust that happiness follows such a pursuit. But chasing happiness itself, it is the most elusive. It is the most elusive and, um, and will, will, like water, slip through the fingers. And so whatever it is that you want, don't chase after. The other case that's most commonly quoted after happiness would be success. Don't chase success, right? Chase purpose, chase purpose, and success can follow. But if you chase success, um, it will also slip like water through your fingertips. Um, this also may be true. Now, it, now let's, let's take it towards something more noble, not that success and happiness are not noble, but the pursuit of God. Whatever it is that you want, don't chase it. Interesting. Well, if I want closeness with God, shouldn't I chase that? So that's interesting. What does it mean theologically? Or what does it mean if you love someone? Should you chase the person you love? Take a parent-child relationship. Sometimes smothering a child makes the child flee. So how do you get closer to a child without chasing them? Right? Or, or, or someone you want a, a, a romantic or dating relationship with. There, it sounds like mere strategy. Oh, you don't want to um, overwhelm them. Don't call them too much or text them too much in the dating relationship because then you, you want to play hard to get, right? It sounds like it's mere strategy, but so too with a child. Don't just, you know, like my, my son doesn't love smothering. Okay, so maybe I don't need to like hug him so tight all the time, give him space. But is it just strategy or is there a deeper lesson there around this idea of not chasing so proactively, perhaps even aggressively, that which we want, right? What does it mean to kind of align ourselves and allow that alignment process like magnets to kind of naturally connect, right? So too with the divine relationship, we might just chase after God almost running or instead of looking externally, what we might do is open up more space within the self to receive, Open up space within the self to find, right? Heschel's famous book, God in Search of Man, implies that God is searching for us. In fact, what we need to do is not chase after God. It's almost like we collide with each other. 
like two trains hitting each other. What we need to do is pause and open ourselves to see, to listen, to hear, right? So Rav Pinchas Koret says, whatever it is that you want, don't chase after it. Here's another way to say it, because I think about this organizationally. If we want more people to come to VBM, right, do we just have to have a better marketing strategy to get more people to come learn at VBM? Or do we need to think, let's be really clear on what the learning is we're doing and do it really, really, really well and trust that it's going to happen. Now, both approaches are wrong, of course. Those who over-market and have a weak product are not going to be successful, or at least I think they shouldn't be. Um, but also, naively, those who have a great product but don't know how to market aren't going to do so well. And so from a business perspective, of course, you want to do both. I do think the Jewish community should be heavier on product quality and lower on marketing uh, aggressiveness. We see a lot of institutions who have huge marketing budgets, right? And their product is vir virtually nothing. It's a very weak product, but they attract a lot of people because of this marketing strategy. So I'd rather us see us double down on quality of product rather than on, uh, on marketing. In any case, whatever it is you want, don't chase after it is Rav Pinchas Kortz. So how does that how does that relate to Rav Shigar's broader point here, uh, which he's drawing on Rav Mo Moshe Kodavero as well? The secret of revealing is through covering. What do you mean? It's a paradox. If the secret the secret of revealing is revealing, uncovering. You want to show someone something, you uncover the hiddenness, right? God is going to reveal Torah. Speak the Torah. Right? You're going to reveal yourself to someone so new, be vulnerable, and speak your truth. What does it mean the secret of revealing is through covering? Right? So I'm not going to answer that. I just want us to think about that a little bit. But this idea here that, um, um, that in some sense, we have to cover part of the self or part of the truth in order to reveal another part right? Or we need to actually conceal in order for revealing to actually make any sense at all. The other question is to who, who is being concealed? To whom is something being concealed and to whom is something being revealed? Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses goes up into the cloud. Now Moses can see relatively clearly, but to everyone else, Moshe has entered into a fuzzy place. To everyone else, Revelation is an experience purely of concealment, whereas there's something more clear. But even to Moshe, there's a, there's a concealment. God's face is covered. Moshe says, God, show me your face. And yet um, God does not show God's face. There's Hester Punim. Um, yes, Vicky's point here, uh, show, don't tell. That's also a very fascinating point, Vicky. This idea that the concealment is in telling and the revelation is in showing. This is another way of saying um, our actions should speak louder than our words, right? Or um, um, don't trust me, see for yourself, right? You know, I used to have a, a teacher who in the end of what we call a musr schmooze, in the end of his kind of inspiring talk, he would say, don't trust me, try it out yourself, right? And I would say that for anything I say as well. Never, never just trust me on something I say, right? Try the idea out yourself, right? Because I believe in, in, in epistemological pragmatism, which is to say, I believe that truths should be experienced in the world, not be leaps of faith into some abstractions. And so, wow. I, so I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pause after the Rav Shigar quote. I just think we had to unpack it a little bit because it's so loaded. So, um, okay, so we're going to keep this, this idea pending here. So just to unpack a little bit where we are so far, we're talking about weaving, and the weaving led us into clothing, and clothing led us into the wedding ceremony, and the role of clothing in the wedding ceremony, and one of the two dimensions there is around the idea of the bedekin, the idea of concealing and revealing, and the idea that intimacy is predicated on the idea that we, we conceal ourselves to others in order that we can reveal ourselves more intimately right? This is the idea that we clothe our body sexually to the public and reveal our body to, a, to someone intimately that we have, we have an intimate relationship with. We don't reveal our body intimately with everyone that loses the intimacy. So too, God has a revelatory experience, which is unique. This is why 
in Jewish theology, revelation is not for humanity. Revelation is for Klal Yisrael. It's for the Jewish people. Mount Sinai, yes, there's the Noahide laws for universe, universally, but Sinai is for the Jewish people. That does not preclude there being revelation to other peoples. Um, that doesn't mean that Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, that they might not have their own channel of access to God. It merely means that the Torah is God's revelation to the Jewish people. The most articulate spokesman of such an idea was the late Jonathan Sachs, which is still, I know, sinking in for many people that he has passed away. I'm actually thinking, tell me if you're interested in doing a class in the coming days on his legacy um, because it's so rich. And the reason I want to wait till after Shiva is because I think it would be a better credit to his legacy than giving him just accolades of his greatness to actually doing a critical review, which in my view would be um, uh, 80% high accolades in terms of what he achieved, but 20% uh, a critical review because I think he's, he's worthy of that. He deserves to have uh, critique uh, as part of, his, part of his honor. And I have at least nine points of critique in his thought and in his leadership. But I would most certainly wait till after Shiva to offer any critiques. Um, I would never do that within the week of Shiva. So let me know if that's of any interest and maybe we can do something like that. Um, because I know of, um, there are people who merely know him from his books and, um, and that's not an enough. And there are people who know him as a, a direct student and feel a love. And I'm neither um, merely a, a, a student of his books, nor am I a, a, a close Talmud. And so I'm kind of positioned uniquely to be um, uh, a big fan and um, in, in a, in a, soft, a soft critic. In any case, Jonathan Sachs it makes the best case for what it means to uh, engage Jewish revelation, but also to honor the revelation uh, revelations and others. Of course, the, the Haredi establishment forced him to retract, forced him to retract in his book, his argument that there are multiple channels towards um, accessing God. Um, he was very clear in his writing that he believes in um, multiple truths, not as a form of moral relativism, but a theological relativism. Uh, that doesn't mean that he doesn't think Jewish Judaism is the most uh, true manifestation, but that he would not discredit other faiths' understanding of how God speaks to them, um, and even finds truth in them, for, for them, not for himself, but for them. Okay, um, okay, Avi Hoffman, Lauren Blatt, uh, a few other folks here. Yes, uh, Cheryl, thank you. Okay, and I think I missed another thing Cheryl wrote over there. Um, doesn't concealing make others look more deeply for what is not obvious? Look into the soul. Ah, beautiful. Um, doesn't concealing make others look more deeply for what is not obvious? Oh yeah, I love that. Yeah, you know, I never, I hadn't even thought of it that way, Cheryl. Also, because if everything was just clear and wide open, there's no searching process. There's no discovery process, right? The hard work of intellectual search, of spiritual inquiry. It, spiritual inquiry enables one to get beyond levels of concealment, which is necessary for that spiritual process. Um, and so that concealment also enables us to go more deeply because, and I know this seems kind of trite, but the idea that it's more about the journey than the destination, which is so commonly quoted, but it's so, such a, a piece of deep spiritual truth that the spiritual process is about the search and about the process rather than merely achieving enlightenment, right? Or having perfect truth, um, going through that work. And that's the tragic thing about Jewish life, that um, we don't have rich adult educational processes because we have been taught to believe that everything you need to know you learned in Hebrew school and it was deathly boring. Okay, I know I'm not supposed to say that. I know I'm not supposed to say that. Okay, but, um, but actually that there is a process of Jewish learning and of spiritual search, which never ends. It never ends. And this is one check upon euthanasia because the fullness of life is, is in the fullness of life. And there are things that happen in end of life moments um, this is not me making a conservative view on um, that we should never um, allow life to be ended, um, you know, peacefully, but merely to see the value in what can happen in all processes of life. 
the, the, the revelation that happens for a baby prophecy was given to the fools and the children as it says in the Talmud, but also that the revelation that can happen, um, the prophetic moments that can happen at the end of life. In any case, okay, okay, back, back to our, um, back to our process here. Um, Oreg, Oreg. Okay, so that was Rav Shigar. Now back to clothing. Clothing, besides its obvious practical qualities, represents covering and, 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 uh, and revealing. On the other hand, the covering aspect of clothes can represent deceit, deceit. Consider Yaakov, consider Jacob, dressing up to deceive his father Yitzchak, Isaac. The Hebrew term for clothes is beged, while the Hebrew for betrayal is bigida. The root for both words is clearly connected, beged and begida. Likewise, the Hebrew word for overcoat is me'il, while the Hebrew for treachery is me'ila. And finally, although we could do this for hours, so I'm going to stop after this, the Hebrew for covering, like clothes, is kasut, while the, he, while, um, while the Hebrew word for concealment is kisui, right? So in all these cases, we see the connection between clothing and deceit, right? Um, we, can, we can continue to hash that out, but I think that's enough examples. Clothing has the potential to represent authority or power. How do we feel when we see someone in a police uniform, a military uniform, or medical clothes? What does such attire convey to us? Or religious garb, like a priest cloak, or a turban, or a talis, or a kippah? Power and authority are both exemplified by clothing, but they are different qualities. In fact, power is more complicated than simple authority. In exploring this issue, Professor Stephen Lukes identifies three primary dimensions of power. Now, in a social context, here we're excluding power as the mere use of force. When we talk about power, we normally mean the power of a military or the power of brute strength, right? But here we're dealing with power, which is excluding the notion of force. We could, we could identify dozens of dimensions here, but here Professor Lukes identifies three primary dimensions. First, to withhold from complying with another's desires. For example, not voting for them, right? I exercise power socially by not voting for someone or voting for someone. On a collective level, this is about winning an observable conflict where there are observable, observable preferences, right? Okay. Observable conflict, observable preferences, I'm going to choose to support or not support individually and organizing collective our power, collectively our power. Number two, agenda setting. Who decides what is decided, right? Raising issues that become part of the new discourse, the power of media, the power of education. Uh, but really education goes into the third power, shaping others' thinking, how we shape others' thinking not merely using our collective power in voting or in um, compliance, not merely setting the agenda for what's on the table to be discussed or not, right? Um, but um, shaping thinking. So number two would be something like, well, should American public be more concerned with systemic racism right now or with um, climate change and the environmental disaster? And there are fair debates there. Um, among, among many other issues. And there are those who are fighting to set the agenda. This is the issue that determines the soul of America. Democracy, environment, racism. This is the issue that determines everything else, right? And there are people who sometimes very fairly and intellectually will try to set that agenda and sometimes in ways that do harm to other worthy causes to say all those other causes not really so important the soul of america is on line with this issue this is the do all and be all this defines our humanity right and there's a lot of cases to make and sometimes it's done too exclusively but then lastly beyond the agenda setting shaping others thinking on a meta level the power of shaping thinking okay now foucault as we looked at a few sessions ago foucault argued the power, that power is everywhere in our disciplinary society. But Luke's approach that we're looking at here suggests that social power is unique and specific. It's not interdimensional, multidimensional, flowing in all, you know, uh, in all directions, but rather very specific, very targeted, very intentional. 
and that we should work to attain the awareness of what influences we live under. And so clothes deceive us into thinking that authority figures hold all the power. Oh, those are the powerful, they're the rich, they're the people who wear clothes like this, and those are the powerless, they dress like this, and they have less resources, and that's clear, the powerful and the powerless, right? And Foucault challenges all of that, and Luke's also is challenging that. Or that roles symbolized by our respective garb represent a true reality of ontological roles instead of constructed social status. Why do people buy the clothes they do? And what does that say about power, right? Some right, people might just say, this is cheaper, or this is um, the store close to me. But really, clothes are very intentional around power, right? What is my brand, right? Who are the people I want to look like? How do I dress? Um, now, I, I gave a very charitable interpretation of Haredi garb uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and I want to reiterate that. And, let, and then let me give a, a slightly less charitable interpretation. A more charitable interpretation I offered, although I spent a lot of time on it, so I'm not going to rehash it all, was modesty, right? Um, modesty. I want to dress modestly. I don't need to wear bling bling to look to look beautiful, right? Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to wear. I'm take the, take the Haredi man for a minute. I'm going to wear black and white. It's simple. It's modest, right? The second charitable interpretation was my individuality, my authenticity is going to be expressed intellectually and spiritually, not through my clothes. I don't need to wear cool shoes or some fancy shirt to express my authenticity. I'm going to just wear a simple black and white. I'm going to express that differently. Now, a less charitable view is that this is power clothes. This is power clothes. This is clothes that represents a political faction, a political faction, the Haredi faction, that is, that is counter, counter-cultural. We're going, to, we're going to put bigger walls up and close out the outside world. And we're going to build political power in America and in Israel. And we're going to be clearly identified. We're going to be clearly identified in who we are. And it's a uniform. We're wearing a uniform, a political uniform. Okay? So um, our clothing choices are political. And, um, and, and I've been thinking about this with our foster kids. Because now, um, these little, uh, sweet little Mexican-American boys that we dress, I'm the one dressing them. And what does it mean? Now, they're totally unconscious of any of the symbolism that emerges here. But I'm the one dressing them. And, um, and what does that mean to dress someone else? I mean, we dress our children. But then to have a child that's in your care from another culture and a whole other <laughs> reality on many levels, uh, to be the dresser of someone else. Um, it's, it's funny because I have no sense of style, which I don't mean to, say, to, to sound um, um, uh, uh, like I'm some uh, righteous person who is, you know, isn't concerned with vanity. I really just don't think about style or have any sense of style. I wear the same thing every day, the same colors, the same <laughs> stuff. I just, I, I don't care. I, but if I, anything my wife tells me, I just do it. She says, oh, that, you know, don't wear that or wear that. I just do it. You know what I mean? I, because she's, she, you know, she'll know and I, and I have no clue. Um, but what it means to, um, to ultimately dress people. Okay, we're going to come back to this idea of dressing people. But here we're still on this idea of power and language. Now, Wittgenstein, Lud Ludwig Wittgenstein, the 20th century Austrian philosopher, wrote about the use of language as a mask, language as a mask. He compared the idea of clothes hiding the true body to language hiding the true reality of thought. Unpack that for a second, right? Clothes hides our body, right? In fact, many people buy clothing specifically to hide their body. I don't want to look a certain way. I want clothes that are going to, are going to conceal what my body... Now, other people want the opposite. They want their body, they want their clothes to reveal their body, right? Others want their clothes to conceal their body. Those are different orientations towards clothing. Um, but he says the idea of clothes to hide the true body, so too language hides the true reality of thought. Now, I'm not a Wittgenstein scholar, but what any Wittgenstein scholar will say is that there's two Wittgensteins, an early Wittgenstein and a late Wittgenstein, and his theories of thought um, on language are diametrically opposed. I'm not going to get into that. Um, I did stand at his, uh, at his, uh, um, at his uh, grave when I was in Cambridge uh, just a few years ago, in, in, uh, not, not Boston, in, uh, you know, in the UK. Um, in, in Cambridge, and, uh, and, and I do have a lot to say about Wittgenstein, but far from a scholar of Wittgenstein. In any case, 
here's what he says. This is from his tractus Logico Philosophicus. Language disguises the thought so that from the external form of the clothes, one cannot infer the form of the thought they clothe because the external form of the clothes is constructed with quite another object than to let the form of the body be recognized. <laughs> I get so excited about picking that. Okay, given today's experience with mask wearing, we can relate to the question of whether a mask is a disguise or whether it's protection or whether it's both. In any event, thinking about the relationship between masks and language brings us to a fascinating debate about the adequacy of language to portray our true thoughts, true reality. In modernity, there was a lot of confidence in language. Consider Freud's notion of talk therapy. To reveal the hidden truths from childhood depended upon speaking to the psychoanalyst, right? Freud believed that the power of language will reveal the, the, the deepest inner truths if we merely go to that, that, that space where language can, can um, be liberated from social conformity into a safe space of expression. Yet in post-modernity, building off of Wittgenstein, the idea has emerged that language is utterly inadequate symbolism of truths understood much deeper that cannot be deveyed, conveyed in language, right? This emerges in post-Holocaust theology that um, the experiences of evil, of trauma, right, are far beyond the description of reason and the description uh, that, that can be used through language, which of course is deeply interconnected with reason. And so too, the, 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 question it's, the, the questions themselves are absurd, right? Prove to me there is a God, right? Explain to me why the Holocaust happens, right? Use reason and language to explain to me how, how, what happened to you in the Holocaust, right? These are utterly flawed um, um, attempts. And in post-modernity, we will understand that consciousness, that is to say, human experience, or better said, Awareness, our awareness of human experience is far deeper than what we can explain. Now, the, 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 most, the easiest way to describe such a thing is love. Could I use words right now to exp express how I love my daughter? No. Now, it might be that I'm not smart enough. It might be that, I, that I'm not smart enough to find the words to explain to you how I love my daughter or how I love God, right? Or it might be, that language is utterly inadequate. The best attempt in the Jewish tradition to do it is called Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs. Now, interesting enough, uh, I saw, uh, yes, going back to Jonathan, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory, that he, he was asked uh, if he could bring one book, one, one book to a, um, an isol a stranded, you know, an isolated island, what would you bring? And he said, I'd the, bring the Song of Songs, which I thought was an interesting answer. Um, but the, the Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, Traditionally, of course, it's love poetry, right? If you want to read it on the shot level, on the, on the literal level, it's, it's romantic love poetry. But on the religious, uh, non-literal level, it, it, is, it, is, uh, it, is a, it is about love of God and the search for God. And, um, and Rabbi Soloveitchik builds his whole Koldo um, uh, Dita fake based on this uh, work. Um, in any case, um, uh, the attempt to describe love in, 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 in language uh, for most of us would be impossible, impossible. Um, okay. Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell writes about how the hero has to go out and slay the dragon. But right after he has done so, he realizes the dragon is not gone. It is still inside him. Uh, you slay the dragon and the dragon is still alive. Of course, sometimes one does have to go out and slay the dragon to save themselves or to save others. But one must always know that they are still not defeating the dragon inside, the resentment, the anger, the psychological dimensions that generate the dragons. The clothes of the hero and the clothes of the enemy can give a sense that good and evil are clearly discernible. But either way, we still just see clothes covering up the deeper 
internal realities. Now, let me give two relevant um, modern examples <laughs> or very recent examples. One might say, oh, we won an election, right? That era is over, right? Uh, whatever one is seeking to defeat in an election, right? And yet one might say, is it really over? Is the phenomenon that produces social realities really over? Is the thinking that leads to certain political conclusions really gone, right? Is, um, uh, is the work actually completely masked? A, 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 an election result is a technical solution to adaptive challenges. What is the adaptive work that emerges after technical conclusions? Some people say, oh, all about political power. I win, it's over, right? Other people understand. There's a spiritual dimension. There's an educational reality. There's a dialogue component. There's healing pieces to this. Those who merely w wish to win and then smother or smash opposition will find themselves quite surprised at, at the realities that emerge from such an approach. Let me take a different approach. Um, there are those who think we should merely incarcerate evil. There are those who think we should merely bomb terrorism. Right now, it's true. There may be times. I'm not a. I'm not a war pacifist. I'm not a war. I'm certainly not a war hawk. I'm. I'm probably a centrist when it comes to war. Probably slightly to the left of center, um, but definitely not a war pacifist. It's hard to read the Jewish tradition and not think that just war theory applies, um, as we talked about last time. Um, uh, and and so uh, so too. I think there are times you have to bomb terrorism. You got to bomb it because the threat to save your family is real. You have to bomb the site of terrorists to stop an impending threat. You have to incarcerate people who pose a violent threat to society, right? I think it's real. And I think we can't be naive about those threats. However, if we thought that bombing terrorists and incarcerating um, all violence was actually going to solve the problems we're wishing to solve, that would also be incredibly naive to think there's not systemic structural challenges, which are economic, which are political, which are uh, educational, um, right? We understand what happens in the desperation of poverty. That's why many suggest that the way you, you combat Hamas is not just through bombing Hamas, right? You actually want to improve the economic life, right? Within Hamas, right? Not just strangle them to desperation. But if people have a sense of hope of their future because they have clean water, because they have possible jobs, then they don't want, they care more about not, um, there, there's a lot more at stake for what they're trying to develop, right? Okay. So how do we get here? How do we get here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Joseph Campbell says, the hero goes and slays the dragon and says, woohoo, we slayed the dragon. It's all over. And then realizes that the dragon is hidden inside. Now, there's two parts to that. Of course, there's the dragon hidden within the sense of the self. The very evil we combat in society, I, I can't say this enough. This is like my, my like top three points I make in the world. The evil we combat in the world lives in us. And the people who are out there merely pointing outwards, not at the self, are very dangerous people, right? People who don't see the evils they're combating in the world inside themselves. Even if it's into a very small degree, right? the racism within all of us, right? The homophobia, the sexism within all of us, but also the greed within all of us, right? But, if, but even beyond those isms of modernity, right? The dragon, right? The very human dimensions of fear. We li all live with fear. We all live with hate, right? We all live with certain human realities that we think by slaying some external thing, we will be okay. If I slay what puts my security at risk, I'm okay. But actually, inner security, inner peace is a different reality from external slaying. Some people think that if we chase, going back to Koretz, if we chase the good, we'll somehow get it. But in fact, what we're chasing is already right here. It's already here. So yes, I may go outside to, to find the, the prize of gold. I may go outside to slay the dragon. But the dragon that has to be slayed is inside of me. Okay, so one part of the dragon is about the internal search. The other part of the dragon 
is societal, that the dragon exists on a hidden reality. So, to, okay, now we're going to make a leap into a whole other realm. Oh, and I love this. I can't believe I'm finally bringing this. It took 19 of the malachot to get here. Oh, it's 1040? How did it get to 1040? I'm so sorry. I'm getting carried away. I'm getting carried away. Okay, let me move on. Uh, the, the whole idea here was 15 to 20 minutes of uh, presentation and then open it up. So I'm very sorry. I got carried away. Okay, to understand moral conflicts, we need to go inwards and probe underneath the surface. Consider three moral dilemmas. These are famous in philosophy. Number one, most famously, one is driving a trolley. If it continues straight, it will run over and kill five people. If the driver pulls a lever or a lever, it will turn left and run over and kill one person. What should the driver do? Most think that actively pulling the lever and killing one is less bad than passively staying course and killing five. Yes, it's me actively killing the one instead of passively killing five. But somehow, even though every life has infinite value, somehow saving four or killing one instead of killing five is better. Okay? Everybody's heard that case. That's case number one. In a second case, the tension is still between five and one, but this time one must push, quote unquote, a fat man violently and aggressively off a bridge to fall on the track to prevent the train from running over and killing five people on the track. Now, it's crucial to the philosophers that it is a, quote unquote, fat man, since he is so abnormally large, large enough that he can actually stop the train and one cannot consider throwing themselves off the bridge since they will not be large enough to stop the train. In this scenario, even though it is still one versus five, most are not willing to actively throw the man off the bridge. Okay, got the case? Okay, number three. In a third case, one does not need to physically push the fat man and as the philosophers call him, right, this marshmallow man, the size of which can stop the train in a way that a, a normal human could not off the bridge, but merely pull a switch that will pick him up and drop him on the tracks. While more are willing to do this than in scenario two, where they physically have to push the man, it is not so many more. Essentially, still, most are not willing to actively put the man on the track. Here we are trying to understand why we prefer some moral approaches to others, even though the results are ultimately the same. Some have explained the phenomenon based on Thomas Aquinas' doctrine of double effect. Essentially, even though there is a foreseen consequence, it is not intended. Get it? Even though there's a foreseen consequence, it is not intended. Even though each case has a clear consequence that will emerge, how active our intention is remains crucial. For many religious groups, this resolves some end-of-life conflicts as well. For one who is unwilling to intentionally euthanize another, but also wants to reduce suffering. Based on the doctrine of double effect, one can offer end-of-life pain management where one foresees death but does not actually intend it. On the surface, moral dilemmas are clear. Saving five lives is better than saving one. But once we dig into complicated facts and realities, we see that moral dilemmas are rarely clear and simple. They are often clothed or covered to represent ideologies, and we can just follow an ideology. Oh, I'm a, deontolo a deontologist. I am a utilitarian liberal, conservative, reform, or orthodox, capitalist, or socialist. Ideologies prescribe solutions, and so we think we need not think. Oh, I just will say what every reform thinker says. I'll just say what every orthodox thinker says. Oh, I'm a Republican, so I'll say what the Republicans say. I'm a Democrat. I'll repeat what they say, right? But in fact, when we strip off the ideological clothes, we see a more complex reality. After having looked at the many steps necessary to prepare for weaving, we now conclude our examination of weaving. In a broken, imperfect world, there can be something deeply satisfying to complete a basket, a garment, tapestry. Indeed, it can fill us with a sense of wholeness from such completion. This is, a, this is the feeling we strive for on Shabbat as well. We look at an incomplete, broken world, but we, but we weave together a perfect mishkan of time, 
as a sanctuary within the storm. And so on Shabbat, we reflect on the weaving of garments and tapestries and the notion of coverings. This encourages us to reflect on the processes of revealing and concealing, elucidating and deceiving, complicating and oversimplifying. Further, connected to weaving, clothing is the notion that God clothes the naked, and we must emulate this beautiful divine attribute. May our weaving be for kindness. Okay, friends, I'm sorry to have overgone my time. I got a little carried away, a little bit excited here. Um, but uh, let me pause now to hear some questions and thoughts and agreements and disagreements from whoever here. Thank you. By the way, I got a new mic. Is the mic working okay today? Good, good, good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, please just unmute yourself when you're ready. Avi, I see your hand up. Go, just unmute yourself. Thank you. Irish Molly, thank you so much. Much appreciated. This is awesome. So you, you started in the beginning, you were talking about the, about the deepest revelation occurring through covering the face. And the secret of revealing is through covering. I think that was the Rama. So I'm wondering if you, if you uh, thought about the connection to Purim and how that relates to that holiday in particular. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Well, do you have something you want to share about that first? Uh, I, I'm just thinking about the question. In Purim, a lot of people like to dress up. And when I was in yeshiva in Israel, one of my uh, rabbis said that children who dress up on Purim, it's because the rest of the year they're revealing themselves. But on Purim, they're, they're the ones who dress up. Adults who are hiding themselves the entire year and kind of hiding behind the facade of so many different externalities, they, they're the ones who don't dress up. And I thought that was a very profound uh, message, very profound idea. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking, but I wonder thank if you, you have any thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's really, there's really so much there. There's so much there. So let me just note this, um, uh, because I want to come back to it. it let, uh, let's hear from a few more folks, um, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll respond to a few points at the same time. You commented that the demons are within us and that ideologies are not the solution. So my question is, what are some of the solutions? Beautiful. Thanks, Eileen. Someone else? Hi. There's certainly a lot to think about with, with what you said, and there's so much to comment on too and to try and understand. But one thing with clothes and that just took me back to a time when I was, yeah, I started working and I was one of those feminists that didn't really care about clothes and didn't want to wear makeup. And something was explained to me that I had never understood, that a woman makes a choice even by not wearing makeup. Not wearing makeup is a statement, which unfortunately insults a lot of people. Um, and the other thing is clothing. I mean, clothing becomes, it's almost a tyranny. It's okay if you have to wear a uniform, like I did when I worked in a hospital. But just even what you choose to wear walking down the street, and especially when I lived in Yerushalayim, you had to dress a certain way to identify as modern Orthodox. Um, and it's a tyranny. So that's just a comment. I prefer a mosaic where we're all sewn together with our own preferences. Uh, to quote uh, Cindy Lauper to show our two colors, which to me is much more meaningful. Awesome, thank you, Lauren. Uh, I'm gonna read, uh, I'm just reading what Nona's got over there on the side also. Okay, uh, oh, thank you for that, about weaving. Yes, hi, Cheryl, yes. Do you think mask wearing will ever be looked on as, again in the same way as um, concealing as opposed to protection? I mean, this is like throughout the world. If it will ever be looked on, people will not necessarily regard it as hiding oneself or hiding one's identity. But uh, now, you know, we, we have, like you mentioned about elections and things like that, we have a new kind of a normal normal perception of cover yeah. totally awesome thank you 
Someone else? Okay. Okay, great. So let me start there and we'll see if more opens up. Um, there's, these are such great points. And um, just to reflect uh, uh, briefly on, on, on a few of these points here, um, I guess to start with Cher Cheryl's point there at the end, um, you know, it's so interesting because uh, we know that uh, we're entering scary times and, and I'm not an alarmist, I'm naturally a hopeful person. But what we know now of threats in terms of cybersecurity, what we know now uh, in the ability to produce um, viruses and spread viruses, what we know about the ability to pollute water, what we know about what it takes to create global panic, um, and actually how something very small can be produced that can create mass hysteria and overturn economies and overturn, uh, overturn all of the way of life as we know it. Um, uh, and this is not even to mention climate change. So the idea of having to wear masks, um, the, the idea of having to protect ourselves from the very air we share is unfortunately, this is not gonna be the end of it. And um, I think of our poor children, our poor children who are in schools, who miss out, well, they miss out on so much, but one of the things is facial expressions, right? So much of learning emerges from um, the facial expressions of teachers. And these children are, are my, 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 poor, my, my poor daughter, the, the teacher doesn't leave her desk. She, she's not allowed to come within 10 feet of the teacher's desk. The teacher never comes to anyone's desk. Forget even hugging them or, 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 or a hand, never even comes close. She wears multiple layers of shields and masks. There's this distant person way over there. Can't even see facial expressions. It's like a robot almost like, you know? And um, so, so this reality for children, and you're right, this issue of protection versus concealment. Uh, masks in the past always represented a hiding, a concealment. If somebody wore a mask into a bank, you knew what that meant, right? Um, now, if someone didn't wear a mask into a bank, you know what that means also, right? And so, um, uh, you know, you remember that, uh, actually, let me bracket that tangent. And so I think you're absolutely right. Um, this notion of, um, of, 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 of protection versus concealment, this notion of, um, um, of how we think about personal space and how we think about um, a personal responsibility. Now, to Eileen's point, uh, and there's so much more to say there, Cheryl, so I hope, we'll, I hope we will come back to it. Um, Eileen's point about ideologies. Now, I have to say, like, I don't want to overstate this. I am not post-ideology. I'm not anti-ideology. I think ideology can be very helpful. I think it's very helpful if someone says, you know what? It's true, political parties aren't perfect, but 90%, I think the Republicans have it right. Or I think the Democrats have it right or more. So you know what, it, even some there's, some, there's some people running for office, I don't know exactly who they are, but I'm just gonna vote by party because by and large, it's true, it won't be perfect, but that's gonna give me a pretty accurate view of what I wanna, what I wanna support. Or uh, by and large, I'm a Zionist. And so something that's going to emerge as pro-Israel, yes, it won't be perfect, but by and large, I'm going to support the things that, that emerge as pro-Israel, right? Or by and large, I'm a capitalist. Right? It's true, capitalism has a lot of problems. It needs to be tweaked, tweaked, right? So ideologies, or let me take something that would be simple for us to get behind, right? An ideology of, um, of, uh, of, 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 via hafta recha kamocha right, that loving our fellow, we're going to build an ideology around such an idea that we should love, we should love our fellows. Um, so, 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 and so, and so it's true. I don't think ideology is the solution. We will, we will progress beyond all the ideologies we have today and dismantle them as we do throughout every era eventually um, and see their, their utter inadequacies, the, the, uh, the ideologies that we hold today, which won't stand for our children and our grandchildren. Um, and so, and yet we don't dispose of them. And so I think what emerges is that we don't need to be cynics. We don't need to be flamethrowers that are constantly playing devil's advocate and wanna, wanna break down all establishments and break down all ideological camps. Like that's just destructive. And I can't stand those public intellectuals. I just wanna throw flames on everyone's camps, 
here's why your camp is flawed and your camp, and even though I'm a part of this camp, here's why it's broken. We don't need to be flamethrowers. And yet, as Jews, we should ask critical questions of our denominations, our religious denominations, critical questions of our, of our political parties, critical questions of our ideological camps that show that we're not merely bandwagging on ideologies. And so I think there's always this dance between loyalty and critical thinking. Loyalty might be the wrong word, but um, being ideologically aligned and yet not being ideologically blind. Right. Okay. Lots more to say there. Okay. Now, and Lauren, I think your point is really sharp there around the tyranny of clothing. Once again, who decides what I wear? And here I think, and, and so too, the idea of, of a nudist colony, wearing nothing is political. Wearing no makeup is political, right? Everything is. Just even kippot, you know, a kippah in Israel, in Israel, the color of your kippah is a political statement. Where you place the kippah on your head is a political st statement, right? The size of the kippah is a political statement. You think, geez, how did we take something which is supposed to be consciousness of God, right, and turn it into a political instrument? But that's, that's actually not only tragic, it's the reality of the world. And so all we can strive to do is be more aware that every political choice, excuse me, every language choice is political. Every clothing choice is political. And be aware. Of, of what we're choosing and why. That's why I can't stand when people say, okay, now let me give a little plug because Rabbi David Wolpe is, uh, is, uh, is going to speak from Valley Beat Midrash today at one o'clock, that's in two hours about, and he takes a, 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 a more conservative stand than I do personally, that politics and religion ought to be more separate. And I, he's worth listening to because he's very articulate and very smart. And I think his, his idea is, is credible, even though my, my position stands in a different spot. I'm a little bit more aligned with uh, Rabbi Sharon Brous that says, what, what do you mean they're separate realms? The Torah is about a slave, <laughs> a slave uprising, right? What do you mean that the Torah itself is political? Uh, and nonetheless, I, 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 his points are, are worth thinking about and how do we have responsible separations there? Because there are, there are still responsibilities of separation. It doesn't mean everything goes. Um, so in any case, uh, I, I don't wish to, to make an argument against, against what he's going to say in two hours. Um, but one thing I would say is shtika kohota. Silence is acquiescence. The choice to be silent on a matter is also a political statement. But I would go one step further now. All speech is inherently political, right? Every political choice is a political choice. Do I call people gay folks or LGBT population, right? Do, are, are they Negroes? Right. Or people of color. Right. People say, oh, this is political correctness. Right. But actually what it means to make certain language choices is do I care about how the receiver experiences my language? And I can say, no, political correctness. I don't care about anyone or what they think. I just want to speak the way I want to speak. Or I can say I care about the way I speak and how it affects listeners. And, and other populations, in particular marginalized populations, and how they experience what I, what I choose to say. And so language choices are inherently political, just like clothing is. And so I think the best we can do is become very aware of what we choose and why, and understand that, yes, it may still be oppressive. Okay, last thing, Reb Avi's uh, great point over there around Purim. So much to say here, and you already made a great point there. Um, but this notion is, it's a great reminder that of, of the drasha that Purim is connected to Yom HaKippurim, right? Yom HaKippurim, the day that is like Purim, right? Two days couldn't be more dissimilar. We eat a lot of food, we fast. We show our nakedness to God by revealing ourselves on Yom Kippur. We hide ourselves with masks on, on Purim. And yet the day that is like Purim is Yom Kippur, right? Because once again, as touched on over there, the idea of concealing as an act of revealing. We wear masks on Purim in order that we can learn that we have to take off layers of masks. If we don't put masks on, we might actually come to believe that we are showing our true self in the world. And so we put masks on to remember, right, on a psychoanalytic level, that there are so many masks that are already on, on us. And some of us, some of them should be there, right? Again, because we only take off certain masks in intimate spaces, right? That's the revealing dimension. And some of them are quite harmful because they're masks to ourselves. They're masks on our souls. Some of them, of course, can be really damaging when they're actually 
um, publicly deceitful, right? We wear masks to actually demonstrate that we are something we are not. I am pious when I'm really a fraud, right? I'm really, I'm really robbing people and deceiving people, and yet, you know, I look like a religious person. I mean, we're very aware of, of this happening in the world, right? Child molesters and crooks and, and the like, right? Um, uh, and, and so, and yet, this other, this other idea here also that um, um, of, of, of what it means to, uh, to take off our mask, so to speak. Okay, so much more to say here, but we've hit our time. Next week, Malacha 20, we will have passed the halfway mark. So I hope you'll join us, and I hope you will treat yourself well today because all of you deserve to treat yourselves really well and be full of joy and meaning. And we need that in the world right now. So I wish you a blessed day. Do something to make yourself really happy today. You've already done that for me. So I hope you'll do it for you. <laughs> Bye-bye.